actually the book in advance. So when it's crowded, it's only books, otherwise it's a flock. So I mean, you know, granted, it's not the most six in the morning, but I just slept until nine, like 8.30. How you guys doing? Why don't we, we just turn around and wave to the online group, because this is the first time we actually got it right to our online group. Hey. Hey. Um, um, couple just, Topics. First of all, I apologize, you know, still figuring out, and it did just help me out with this, on the um, links. So if the links don't work, just cut and paste it in there. But still try to, so he's, he's figured it out. So I have not, but we'll try to make it right. But there's another reason it's out with a bunch of links. So if you can't get them to work, just cut and paste them. But ideally, we'll sort this out. Um, How, how are you doing with the vision and mission statements? Again, this is for next week. So vision, mission, metrics, two resumes. Any questions or how are you feeling with that? Is it hard? Is it easy? Hard? Hard. Why is it hard? I think it's hard given that I don't specifically know where I want to be in a couple of years to really sit down and focus and think about it. Okay. But I know my resume says now and where I think I'm headed, but to put it in those concrete terms. But like I said uh, last time too, you know, one way that might be helpful is sort of reverse engineering it. So go with, start with your resume, what you want to say in like three years, and then that might say, all right, well, to do that, then how, what will I need to do, then I can, met, these are the things I want to accomplish to get me there, and that might get you to your mission, and then that might inform your vision. So you might have to sort of reverse engineer a little bit. Uh, anyone else having a hard time with it? Yeah? No, I do. I am having a really hard time. How come? Um, I think I never really uh, made it like sort of concrete with my ideas of what I want to be. Uh -huh. Especially not in my career. So yeah. suddenly I'm sitting there, I'm like, I need to put words to something I don't know what it is. Right. And you're like, great. and it's hard. Like even doing with our little, you know, kind of silly acne example last week. It's kind of hard when you start trying to wordsmith something and, and to make the words mean something. Because that, that's the other challenging thing. Sometimes you give a word and it's kind of a flat word. And, it, and, it, and unless you it, unless it resonates with you and it means something, then it's just, it's just empty words. You know, just like any sort of literature you read, if it's the words resonate with you or in the film, if it seems authentic, um, you a moment, you cry or whatever, but if it doesn't seem on it, it seems cheesy, right? I mean, it's just uh, you know, good acting, good writing, good music. Um, so you, it has to resonate with you. And it, and it is a hard thing. And again, maybe you, some of the things we talked about, like sort of what are your core values or what is your core ideology, and those are the ways it might sort of get you there. And um, who's the one that, you, you've been doing it for a while, right? Yeah, not specifically. Yeah, no, yeah. I know, but again, I'm not trying to call you out. But, <laughs> yeah. but, you know, but you've been refining it, right, over yep. time. And is it getting better and more, more, more actionable? Or? Yeah, I mean, um, just like also, like personally, how many things change, like moving and all that stuff, you know, there was a lot of opportunities that I did see a few months ago that I want to pursue, right. incorporating that into right. my goals. And again, I'm not trying to, you know, Sometimes the same thing with an organization, whether it be a company or sort of not for profit or whatever it is, is things change all of a sudden. And now you either have more opportunities or fewer opportunities. And just like on this example of a trip, you know, you may be sort of sailing towards that island, but as you get there, you may see something else that's even more appealing or different or more challenging. But as long as you're heading in a direction. Um, there's a story of Lou Holtz, who was the coach for Notre Dame, uh, won two national championships. He was out of work. He was like 27 years old. He was out of work. And he uh, didn't know what to do. He was looking for a coaching job. And his wife said, well, why don't you go write down what you want to do? So he's like, that's a good idea. And he went in the other room. He wrote down, you know, which a lot of people do, the 100 things he wants to do before he dies, sort of his bucket list, whatever you want to call it. 100 goals. Goals he wanted to achieve. Um, you know, he's like, he came back. And he was so excited. He was telling his wife. She's like, well, just get a job on there. He's like, no, that's not but one thing he did do, again, this is why sometimes these exercises are useful, is one of his lifetime goals was to coach the University of Notre Dame. Um, okay, whether you like Notre Dame or not, that was something he wanted to do. Uh, he became, I think, the coach of the Minnesota Vikings. And what he put into his contract, he wrote a contract up, you know, so he's coaching professional football, and he said, um, the only way I can break this contract is 
It's a job in Notre Dame, opens and it gives me. So, and it did. So he was so clear in what he wanted, it was very specific that it became a negotiating thing. And he said, so because he wanted to do that and therefore having articulated it to himself, he could articulate it to others and then from when the opportunity presented itself, he was in a much better position to seize it. But had he never sort of written down and said, that's what I want, probably would have never been in the contract, probably never would have happened, those two sort of circumstances never would have intersected. Um, so again, sometimes if you write it down and you say, that's something I want to do, and then all of a sudden the opportunity presents itself, you're like, well, I did tell myself I wanted to do this. Because it's very easy. You may say, you know, I've always wanted to go to a World Series game. And someone may call you and say, I have tickets to the World Series. And you're like, I'm kind of tired. You're like, that is something I said I wanted to do. So when is there going to be a better chance? Or I want to go to the Olympics. Well, you only can do that every two years. So, or every four years, if you know. So you can start to think about, well, if I really do want to go to the Olympics, Am I going to be in Russia anytime soon? Or is it, where is it going to be next? So you can start to articulate, well, how am I actually going to make that happen? Because just saying I want to go to the Olympics, that's one thing. Then start to say, like, realistically, how am I ever going to do that? You know? So uh, if it's in the United States, that makes it easier. And then you're like, well, it's never going to be too much closer. Or, or these are happening. How am I going to make that happen? Or how, I'm going to start to save money now because it's going to be in Russia. Let me save some money because I want to go to the Winter Olympics sometime in my life. And I didn't know this February or whatever it is, then I have to wait another four years or another four years. So, so you start making these very specific things. You start to measure it like, all right, well, how am I going to do that? How am I going to do that? Um, but it is hard. So just think of this as a first pass at this. And again, just like we did with that, you know, Acme, you know, the entertainment alternative to what the world wants to see, your first one's made these, but just getting down or start using a series of adjectives that you want to embody or, you know, and just, or values that you want to embody in your life. Um, and then they may infuse what you do. Uh, but going back to sort of some of the leaders you talked about at the beginning of the class um, when we started, you know, a lot of them had nothing other than who they were. I think you mentioned Gandhi, you know, had no position. Um, Martin Luther King, you know, he was a pastor, but again, no sort of large organization behind them, no huge amounts of money behind them. Um, Mother Teresa, you know, what, you know nothing, she had nothing, and uh, started this you know, international uh, organization. So again, it doesn't mean you need to have all these things behind you. If you have these values and you represent them, then that can sort of reverberate through everything you do. And, you sort of, and it might inform various decisions along the way of where to work, Notre Dame, Vikings, or um, things that represent your value. So again, just it's a start, and it's a start too for organizations. Again, sort of really again think of this as this sort of a mini metaphor for organizations of what kind of business do they want to be in? What kind of so did you take a look at the Procter and Gamble thing? So what, what was sort of their point? Sure, I mean like, you know, three power guys. Right? No, I didn't. Basically, they were saying that they're Right. So they kind of want to represent. And, and frankly, you know, you know, you don't think too much about Procter and Gamble and household items as sort of being inspirational. But it was, you know, smiley and pretty. They want to sort of better people's lives. And and whether that's true or not, but if you are working at Procter and Gamble and you're working on a product and you say to yourself, "Is what I'm doing bettering people's lives?" Well. That's a pretty, you know, it's almost like a Hippocratic oath a little bit. It's like, am I, you know, doing harm or not? Am I helping? Um, and you can kind of rally behind that because you start to think, sort of like we talk about what motivates you. If you think your product is really improving people's lives, it's a lot easier to get to work in the morning. It's a lot easier to be inspired versus just, I'm selling macaroni and cheese or I'm selling Tide or I'm selling, you know, whatever household item. Um, and the other thing they mentioned, again, it was sort of, they did a nice job of sort of business and, um, kind of mission was, and for those people that we, you know, 4.8 million people use Procter & Gamble products, which is astounding, out of 7 billion people. Um, so for that 2.2 that we're not, we're going to reach out to them anyway. One, probably because it's good business, and two, because it sort of fits their ethics. They want to be able to touch everybody, and they pour, and then maybe as the those sort of third world nations evolve, they'll have customers. Okay, so they're just thinking, look at the, like the pie, they want all the pie. They are, they're missing like a, sort of a, a piece of it right now, and that piece doesn't even have buying power, so they're going to reach out to them in another way. And, and in theory, better their lives through not-for-profit. Um, 
And then things, you know, the Google, did you look at the Google sort of 10 things we believe in? You know, what was sort of the thread through that? Making everything easiest for their consumers. Right. Yeah, so that's kind of their headline, is, is their, their consumers. It's not the shareholders, it's their consumers. And I think their view is that'll come back around. And it's, you know, speed, ease of search. I like they commented a few times on kind of, they did not put it this way, but trust with advertising, I guess. Right. It's like they're not going to, there's no shady business practices, I guess. When and and did you believe it? I do. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I guess it depends. I mean, there's a huge the advertising role with Google, but it's, they were speaking specifically with like, you know, what shows up and where it's at, and kind of the process that it goes through right. for you to see what you see. Search versus pop up, and, and if, you, if, it, if it's advertising, it will say sponsored money. It will it'll say that someone's paying for that. Uh, and again, there's a lot of magazines that have gotten black for this, you know, where particularly the Atlantic. Where um, you know, I don't know if you read magazines where that feel sort of it look like it's part of the magazine, you know, and you're reading an article, and they got a lot of flack because there was a uh, a insert from Scientology, and it was really an advertising thing, but it looked like an article, so it looked like it was content when it was really sponsorship, and they got a lot of flack for that because you know Scientology paid them a lot of money, and the sort of the clear, you know, again, if you if anyone look at magazines when you see those things and you're like, this looks like an interesting article, and then you just sort of see subtly at the top. Well, Bezos just put those on the Washington Post front page. Oh, he did? Really? Yeah. So what, what did he put? I didn't even see that. Uh, sorry? What did he put? It's a sponsor concept like that. Um, but it says sponsor. Is it clear? It, no, it, it's no. meant to fit so it flows the journal pattern on the front page, and it's not interruptive. Right. Yeah, he, uh, I mean, you know, a lot, after buying that, a lot of people said, bless you, um, you know, he's going to break a lot of, there won't be a lot of eggs broken in this thing, so he may be experimenting, I mean, who knows where that will go, it will, it, will, it will be interesting to see. Um, well, let's, let's, um, let's come back to the 10 things, and then, and then we'll sort of talk a little more about that and other news. Um, uh, anything else within the Google, sort of, um, 10 things they believe in? Well, you know, the famous one is do no evil. Okay. Well, they also sort of touch on the culture versus strategy thing. Exactly. And a good job, I thought. Of it. Yeah, because they say that you can have creative people, but still they're, they're coming to, to work to maintain the business and the status quo of innovative search engine business. So in reading that, do you want to work at Google or no? Yeah, definitely. It sounds like kind of, <laughs> it sounds like kind of a pleasant place to work. Yeah. And, and accordingly... They're very hard jobs to get, yeah. you know, because you know I think the story is there's like you know you have to go through like six to ten interviews to work there, uh, because it it is a good culture and and the culture is like they said the culture is you know one of those ten things they believe in you know it may not be their strategy overall their strategy is to sort of affect the consumer and make search as easy as possible um, and fast as possible and again so they, they touch on a lot of those things but it was very. It was written in a friendly, kind of, you know, convivial way that you're sort of like, I sort of trust these guys. I mean, that's the way I took it. You may not, obviously. Uh, and uh, where other places, you took it. No, I was just going to say that it had a lot of relation to the Procter & Gamble thing of reaching out to, well, to the majority of the people, saying that they are present in a lot of countries and trying to make successful, you know, democratize the whole idea of the search right, and make it available to everyone. Yeah, they're putting balloons up with the, you know, Wi-Fi on them, so it's like they're trying to make, you know, and again, that's good socially, theory, and it's also good for the business. So, they're, you know, they don't have to, you know, good business does not have to sort of necessarily contravene, you know, social mores, you know. Well, obviously, sometimes it does, um, and it gets confusing. Um, anything in the news this past Right. So I read in The Guardian that BlackBerry is looking to sell their company in a $4.7 billion deal. Uh -huh. yeah, uh, okay, that's a very good question. Remember last week we talked about Twitter. Twitter's doing an IPO, which right. means they're going public. Right, they're doing the opposite. And they're doing it now. So why would they do the opposite? Because their stock price has been plummeting. Stock price is plummeting? And, okay. uh, why else might they do that? So we talked last week, remember, we said that uh, uh, BlackBerry, I think there's one or two people here. Had a black, I think it was one or two. It was mostly working. Um, but BlackBerry laid off 40% of its workforce. We're now sort of going to lay off 40% of its workforce. 
And when you hear that, just like we mentioned, that NPR was going to lay off 10% of the or do buyouts of 10% of its workforce. And so we interpret that as things aren't going that well. Now, we don't need them to say they're going to lay off 40% you know, to know, because again, we just do a little survey here. I think one or two people had it, and you know, five years ago, maybe 30 to 40% of you had one. Um, so, so what is the benefit to this acquisition, proposed acquisition? Um, kind of removing the visibility in the, in the public sphere, um, right, and thing. also getting private investors. Right. Um, um, they could also have more decision making control. So if they have to make major changes to the company, it would be easier to do if they don't have to deal with like the public. Right. And so, so you have a lot more flexibility, and you can have a lot much easier to have like a long term strategy, really. And there's sort of lo less looking at your quarterly returns because why? Because the owners don't have to, you know, the owners aren't the public. Therefore, you know, there's not rules about how they have to disclose certain information. I mean, they still have to abide by the law, but they don't have to disclose all this information publicly, so they can look on a much longer threshold of what to do versus trying to play to the court, right? So, but it is kind of interesting. If you look at Twitter, it's going public. It's releasing itself to the public. It's a liquidity event for some of the investors. They can get their money out, and you and I can then buy it. And what BlackBerry is doing is if you own BlackBerry shares, you can be like, here you go, and that'll be the end of it. You will not be able to trade in it anymore. So, um, but just before I came here today, the uh, so one company was said they bought by for four point seven billion dollars, um, and the stock is trading about mm, about eight point something again. Yeah. Eight, eight, eight point six. Thirty cents a share, and they offered nine dollars. Well, before the end of the day, it closed above nine, implying what? Maybe? This is, this is a good move. What's that? This is, this is a good move for them. It's a good move, but what else? There might be more than one buyer. Yeah. So meaning that looks like, you know, just like if you're buying a house, looks like nine's not going to do it. If there's only one buyer, nine seems generous. But now it's like there may be other buyers saying, we could use that technology, $4.7 million, it's a good brand name. You know, there's certain things you might be able to do with that. Uh, you know, maybe even some place like Apple could do stuff with their technology or Samsung or you know other people may be interested. This, these are just private equity firms that are thinking what they'll do is they'll clean it up, maybe tweak the strategy, and then either try to sell it or take it public again. So it's kind of like you know you can you can sort of in a way it's like think of it like an old car versus like fixing it in like on your, your driveway. You take it into the garage, you close the garage, you fix it up. No one really knows what you're doing, and then you can roll it out. You know, six months from now versus doing it. Public. It is a group. Um, I know that. Oh, it's a consortium of companies. Like the main one is based in Canada. What's that? The, uh, oh, it's, it's they're buyers. buyers. Yeah. yeah. And, um, yeah. It, actually, it's biggest. It's led by BlackBerry's biggest shareholder. Yeah, it's, they own ten percent of the company already. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> that's a, oh no, that's uh, you yeah, know they're, they're private investors. So the main, the lead investor owns ten percent of BlackBerry already. <laughs> so one, they've already have an investment. Two, they probably know a lot about BlackBerry. So that's where you also may say, same thing when Michael Dell was trying to take Dell Computers private. It's like, well, he wants to take it private. Does he know something we don't know? Because he probably does, right? Therefore, you know, this is where it gets kind of, you know, dicey a little bit too. Because again, if you think about like a Fed, you're like all of a sudden, what we talked last week with you, Yang, where we said, you know, Apple, you thought Apple, eh, you know, wasn't what we thought. And then I mentioned Carl Icahn was thinking of buying it. And then you're like, well, Carl Icahn's smart. So these guys already own 10%. Why are they doubling down? You just think of it like a Vegas thing. They're spending another debt on the same thing. So, but speaking of, of Apple, so what happened with Apple over the past week? They were working it. That's it. Apple yeah. started to sell their new generation for iPhone 5S and iPhone 5C. And I know that uh, Tim Cook registered a new uh, Twitter and post he thought about selling this phone. And many people think they are helping Apple to sell their phone because it's not uh, for the it's not easy for them to sell this new generation. Right. So you think it's, it, it'll be hard for them to sell yeah. it? Yeah. But anyone what happened in reality? Well, they sold nine million phones. They sold nine million phones in like a week. Yeah. yeah. So five weirdly five. we're wrong. You know, I went up with the record. No, I, 
Yeah, I, I don't think we are wrong because this is the first time. Like, <laughs> this is the first time I will open the China Chinese market at the first uh, time. So if you think the iPhone 5S, uh, uh, iPhone 4, maybe iPhone 5, they didn't sell the, the new generation at the Chinese market at the first time. So because we have the other market. So you think the other market is almost unrealistically pushing it up to that. behind you and then we'll go there. I was going to say, um, I, I thought it was kind of interesting with the number of sales because I know they were speaking about how there was like a set of Germans that were able to crack like the fingerprinting okay. technology, which led to like a lot of the skepticism that it wasn't going to sell so the as much <laughs> as much as it was. But we talk about we're a generation of technology. We want to make sure that no one can break into right. you know our phones. They talked about that with BlackBerry. So it's interesting that they sold so much, even you know in contrary to the fact that someone broke the security. Right. You know, so. Oh, I thought they had a bad telecom partner in China, so I had to actually make a big push into it. Uh, I'm not sure exactly you know, if this is the first time he's been to China or not. I so they expected him to announce that they found a telecom yeah. partner in China, and he didn't, which a lot of people. Okay. I uh, was just going to say, I'm studying Apple for another class, and so with the 5C, have people seen the, the commercial? It's really interesting how Apple is marketing themselves, because it, there's like a regular commercial, and then there's like a get inside the design factory type thing. It's just really interesting the way they lay it out to make you feel like you're understanding a part of the process, which is basically that it's a color, but it's a different color, and that's it. Yeah. I mean, I don't think there's much more that's that complicated. That's not a selling point? It's just, yeah. Well, it is clearly for a lot of people, but the ad is so good, I wanted to buy it like immediately. It's so good. It's just beautifully done. Uh, and it worked. It worked yeah. for people, right? And they do a lot of times with their ads, you know, they increasingly, they have the designed in, where is it, you know, Northern California or Silicon Valley, where they say, in the middle of the park. So, you know, again, it's a cool design. <laughs> it's not really saying it was made here, you know, for a long time, it's saying, proudly saying it was made. Um, so, last week, we talked about this. Again, we just think of like a stock price. Don't think of it as sort of anything. It's more than anything, it is like perception. What does a lot of other people, yourselves included, as well as a lot of very smart people, perceive the value of Apple is in the future? So, remember last week they came out, the stock went down, Carl Icahn said he thought it was a bargain, he started buying it. So now we have a little more data, right? We have one more data point of 9 million sold. So it seems to be getting a little bit of traction. And then what happened today? The market went down, the general market went down today. What happened with Apple today? It went up. It went up. It went up. It went up by 5%. That's a lot. So, um, so the perception has changed again. And this is where you start to realize that it's hard, you know? And, and it may come down again. Like this may be, to your point, Yang, you're, you're, you may be totally right, and it may say, you know what, I still think um, it's not going to get the traction. But at the same time, it also might say to you, you know, Apple's not stupid. You know, they're not, they're not stupid people working there. They clearly know their customer. They know what their customer wants. There's something like a 91% satisfaction with Apple products. So their customers are loyal. Um, so again, you can start to see how these things can bop up and down. But new information. So last week we did the announcement. I was like, eh. And then now we have actual sales. You're like, oh, maybe, maybe they know something we don't know. You know, uh, and like you were saying, Ted, it's like it doesn't seem that different, but they're selling it in an emotional way, and you want to buy it. You know, and in my other class, a lot of people are like, I'm in, I'm going to buy it. You know, um, same thing with Grand Theft Auto. Anyone go buy that? <laughs> yeah, it sold over like what, 1.2 million, I think. In three days, yeah. Three days, yeah. And then I think their stock went up at like 5% overnight on the first night. So. Yeah. So did you, where, did you go line up at night and buy? No, it? no, I went the next day. Yeah. How about you? Uh, I had my brother do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because I had uh, another class who, uh, who pre-ordered it and still went to GameStop at midnight and waited online for an hour and a half to get it. So, um, um, anything else? Yep, sure. So it's fun from what you saying about the um, Grand Theft Auto. It's like the, I guess they call it like the man's Christmas. Time frame because you have um, Madden, Grand Theft Auto, and then um, 2K14. So that's like the big time frame where it's like there's no one girlfriend or wife around at all. You just play the game. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's just good there. And just in time for Christmas. So if you didn't, call, if you weren't online at GameStop, it'll be around, and that'll be the thing you can keep asking for. It's actually better because a lot of times you'll have um, issues with the with the initial 
um, game that comes out, there'll be a kink or something of that nature. So then we wait till Christmas and it'll be worked out by that time. That's smart. Do you have a man cave? You sound like you might have a man cave. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to, of course, eventually. Uh, anything else generally in the news? The Emmy Awards were last night. The Emmy Awards. Did anyone watch the Emmy Awards? Breaking Bad was on. Breaking Bad was on. Breaking Bad was waiting for you to watch that. Netflix is going to A lot of people just couldn't take that. They won Emmy Awards. And ironically, the stock price went down a little bit because sometimes it's sort of you're selling on the promise a little bit. So people sort of, you know, but it will, it will continue to grow. And it's officially crashed into that kind of echelon of HBO Showtime, which is what they've been trying to do. Um, you know, one thing, so there's a good TED talk on this again. It might just be a useful thing. So I was watching, um, they had the uh, Emmys on the background, so I, I, you know, just the, the sound was off. And there was someone giving their acceptance speech, doing this a lot, you know, like, you know. <laughs> anyway, there was a good TED talk on this where it kind of might just be helpful, a little sort of side candy here, where they talk about um, victory. You know, so when people win, they do this, you know. And, um, you know, so they show some pictures of people racing, and their arms are up like that. And the interesting thing is, the same is true for blind people. So it's not a learned thing, it's like a human thing. Just like, say, when a, uh, um, you know, an animal sort of puffs itself up to be bigger, you know, it's sort of like feeling big. Um, you know, whether it's, it's a porcupine or a peacock, you know, they sort of spread themselves out. And so what her thing was, can you, does it have an effect? And her thing was to say, pay attention to how you're sitting like right now, you know, whatever. But, so sometimes when you sit like this, or you, you know, like this, or you're, you're, you're sort of close. So her tip was, if you have a big interview or a big meeting, go to the bathroom, go in the stall, spread yourself out. <laughs> and strangely, it manifests itself in you. You're sort of expressing yourself as victorious. So again, you start to see these weird kind of animalistic things can inform you. But again, I just sort of noticed it from the, you do watch it, and they're like, yeah, I won, you know, with a statue in here. And it's like this woman in a very nice dress doing so, um, but I digress pretty far. Um, uh, anything else? I read that China's richest man who wants to prove like the motion in the picture doesn't. Yeah. China, and he wants to invest like 8.17 billion dollars. Right. To like make China compete, um, you know, culturally. Uh -huh. Right. So that's going to be like a big. And is that a good idea? Yeah. It is a good idea. Yang, is that a good idea? So China's richest man is going to invest $8.7 billion into infrastructure in China and partner with Hollywood Studios to bring movies to China. Over to you, Yang. Uh, well, as a uh, movie fan, I think it's a good idea. Good. But I, as a you know, businessman, I, I'm not sure. Right. Because we, you know, we, there are always a uh, uh, cultural difference between Chinese audience and American movies are. I, I'm not sure this uh, movie festival or something will be going on. Maybe it's a boom and it disappear. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. my concern. It's a very good point. Because there are huge cultural differences. So you can't just send a product with color over to China and expect them to make it, you know, to buy it. Same thing with movies, which are ten, you know, very cultural. So you know, famously in Hollywood, movies that don't travel well or sports movies don't travel well. Right? Humor doesn't travel that well. Um, uh, so those are the things that don't you know, travel internationally that well. And that's part of the complaint people have with Hollywood is it becomes these sort of lowest common denominator superhero movies because there's not a lot of dialogue. Why? Because they can really work internationally, right? Uh, they're big. And, you know, yeah, Fox Studio invests in a lot of uh, studios in India and they're really successful. And it's been successful. Yeah. They, but they're, what they're doing is local product. Yeah, they're doing. So, and that's a lot yeah. of companies are doing that. So what they're doing is saying, you know what? We're not going to shove our Fox movies down the throat of the 1.2 billion dollars in India. Why don't we just invest in local production? So they've done a lot of companies have done that. They've done it in Russia. They've done it in China, and they've done it in India quite a bit. At the same time, Reliance Corporation did the same thing. The, the, the sound Wu from China has done is they invested quite a bit of money in Hollywood with big name actors like George Clooney, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, say, and, and nothing's come out of it. So you know, Hollywood's good at sort of getting money from other places. The question is, how does it manifest itself into 
product. But yeah, because so you're from you're from where are you from India? I'm from India. Yeah. And what kind of, you like to go to Bali with this product, right? Yeah. Yeah. Which are totally different. You know, actually I worked on a movie in India and you go and you go to the theater and it's just a totally different experience. And then yeah. the storytelling is totally different. You know, you're just like, why are they dancing all of a sudden? <laughs> you know? But it's it's just a different cultural way and you know in the inverse a lot of people have tried to say, I'm going to take Bollywood and bring it to the States, and that doesn't work as well either. You know, even Slumdog Millionaire, they had that kind of you know, nod to Bollywood at the end of the movie, which you know, seemed a little out of place, but made it kind of fun. You're like, why? Now, all of a sudden, this greedy movie, they're dancing in a train station. But again, that was a tip to India. And again, Slumdog Millionaire did not do especially well in India, if you correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, but what did. For example, what Disney does is they just invest on typical Bollywood movies. That's right. what Viacom does. No, exactly. No, this is, this is, just, is it's sort of conceding the fact is we don't. So if let's say there is, you know, Bollywood, I think for now is number two to Hollywood in terms of total expenditure. Yeah. Nollywood is. What's that? Nollywood is. Nollywood is. Yeah. Nairobi. Nairobi. Mm. Really? Yeah. They did. They did. They. Wait, sorry. Now, really, spend more money on films? Oh, but they're they're big. They're bigger than Bollywood, but I don't know. If it's uh, they're bigger. Yeah. Okay, that may be. Yeah, they may make more movies. I'm not sure they're bigger. Uh, I think they may make more movies, but it could be wrong. I have trouble believing. Yeah, yeah. But whatever. It's, it's good. But they're big. I can see. And again, it's local area productions. Um, but yeah, that's what Disney does. But Viacom 18 does totally the opposite. They make. Uh, uh, cultural border movies like an American falling in love with an Indian. Right. Yeah, and they're really successful. They're changing the trend. Yeah. There are no songs in their movies. They're not. They're not songs in their movies, and they work. And they work. Yeah. It's again. It's sometimes changing just the cultural ways that people experience it. You know. And all the. I mean, we can talk about. You know, even the financing movies in India is a totally different here. Because in India, it's the theater owners that pay for the financing of the movies versus here. You make the movie, you take it to a different. So again, there's also you know. You think it's a thing that you can just export around the world, but it's really hard. And that's why Hollywood is having this trouble of trying to sort of, you know, that's where the growth is coming internationally, and that's why they're sort of looking at to sort of new ways. At the same time, so DreamWorks last week, um, they had a movie Turbo, and again, just like we talked about, whether it's Carl Icahn, um, they, the forecast for the box office on Turbo has been downgraded, therefore, the stock goes down because they think the future earnings of DreamWorks will be lower. And DreamWorks is a really good example for Hollywood because it would be a pure play. It is all they do is make movies. They make animated movies and nothing else. And so where their stock goes is sort of an indication of the general understanding of film business. Lionsgate's a little bit that pure play. You know, there's no theme parks or consumer products or cruise lines. It's just this is what they do. They make movies and TV shows. So, um, let me just see if there's anything else here. Uh, one other kind of interesting thing, speaking of Disney and movies, is they're launching, they're doing a test with The Little Mermaid. They're re-releasing The Little Mermaid, but you play a game with an iPad in the theater. So you bring your iPad to the theater and you play a game. So second screen's a big topic with TV. So I'm sure there was a lot of second screen on. Anyone watched like a second screen when they did the Emmys last night? They did. They did. So what, what were you watching? My, uh, like something on Netflix. Oh, you were watching. You were watching something totally different. Yeah. So you were like multitasking. Exactly. But you weren't like on the Emmys, like I'm going to vote or let me hear the backstory or like look through this. That that's sort of more the idea of sex to sort of take you. You're sort of experiencing it too much. Sports is big for that. So you watch the football game, you're getting statistics here, you're getting backstory. So you're just multitasking. You're like, and you have your phone on something else. Well, the Emmys was on. If that was on mute. I was just like seeing, like looking up to see who won. I think Netflix had Frasier, and then I had my phone, and I was also doing homework. So you're watching Frasier on Netflix? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now you're doing your homework. I like so I the focus that homework's getting. Yeah. I'll do my homework with Frasier on the back. Really? That's a strange choice. I love, I, mean, I love Frasier. I think Frasier's hilarious. He is funny. Yeah. I wouldn't have thought you, I wouldn't have paid you for a Frasier watch. <laughs> but second, second screen, generally, you think about it as something. So, like for the Super Bowl, yeah. I was saying that the NBA does a very good job of that as well. When it comes to the um, All Star Weekend, yeah. they're doing dunk contests. You can actually vote. Well, I was doing normal. Like, and do you so do that? Oh yeah. Yeah. In your mandate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but like, 
You've got like Red Death Auto over here. The Grand Theft Auto thing is the game. <laughs> no, but that, that's a better example. So like the Super Bowl this past year, they sold out admin inventory for both on air and then also on second screen. And so now what Disney is experimenting with is, can you have a second screen experience in the theater? So you bring your iPad, and if you don't have one, they'll give you one, and you play along with a game on, and they break you into teams. So you can be in different teams. <laughs> I, I, did, I didn't attend. What's that? Isn't that distracting to the audience? No. Well, we all, but in theory, everybody in the audience is doing it. It's a test, yeah. But then, like, when it comes to the piracy issues, how do you know someone's not going to like record the actual movie? Well, I think Little Mermaid piracy issues are pretty well documented. Yeah, but I mean, like, how do you know that Little Mermaid is going to be on YouTube? But um, but I don't. But you're but you're on your screen. You're watch. You're not you're not downloading the movie. There's, there's, there's a whole different experience on this on your screen. It's like I can't. I, I didn't do it. But um, I have to say. It. <laughs> <laughs> a, but it's experience. So who knows if it'll work? But you could, if, what it does give you is a clue into growth. All right. How are they planning to sort of grow or sort of make the same thing with football? We talked about sports a little bit. It's very increasingly hard for sports teams to get people where? In the stadium, why? Well, you, you can you probably answer this the best, right? What are you talking about? Why is, it, why is it harder for sports teams to get people to attend the games in person? I think we're a lazy, like a lazy society. We don't want to go anywhere. We just want to stay well, you're in our basement. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> to the basement, man cave. Sure. The viewing pleasure on TV is the TV experience has become so good. Like you just said, you're, you're, you've got the second screen going, you've got the game, you can pause it, you can go play Grand Theft Auto, you can come back to it, you can get up and go to the bathroom, you can have whatever food you want, and what does it cost you incrementally? Nothing. You go to get? And also when you go to the stadium, it's so far away that you're probably going to look at the screen either it's way. Right. So it like it's far away, it's traffic, it can it's be cold, it can be raining. You, yeah, you. Um, I was listening to the news this morning. Oh, Brandy. Um, I was listening to the news this morning, and I'm not sure if it plays into why they wouldn't go now, but I know they were talking about the Super Bowl and what if they made it free. Because they were saying, you know, they really don't need the money, the revenue from it, but people can't go because of the ticket scalping and the prices. But people would go. I mean, that's just like the this people. This is just like a hypothetical, right? Look, somebody wrote an article on it, okay. and was it was on New York One. You know how like they go through like the daily review of right. what they found in the art, the news. Um, but just like people go to like the bar to watch the sports games or some Sunday night football, they go to the bar because you know they don't have to pay anything to get into the bar, but they still spend the money on the food. So right. what if the Super Bowl was free? Everybody would go. Maybe spend money yeah, in the stadium. Sure. Nice. <laughs> I, I read an article too about how stadiums are trying to like uh, come back to my fight TV. Uh, some of the new stadiums, what they like my own name, yeah. uh, like Atlanta is talking about putting in rumble seats and their seats that yeah. when there's a big hit on the field, you feel it in your seat. So it's kind of nuts. Like the smell I mean, they're, they're trying smell anything <laughs> to, <laughs> to get people to come in. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge to get them to come to the stadiums because it's such a good experience. Yeah. I think on FedEx Field in Maryland does a good job at that as well with the Redskins. It's like not just going to a football game, it's like an experience. Yeah. And I think that's what a lot of, like he was saying with um, Georgia Dome and also um, what the Cowgirls. Um, Cowboys? Cowboys? Cowgirls. Cowboys? Cowgirls. Oh, I don't like them. <laughs> uh, what's the team? Dallas. Yeah, Dallas. Yeah, Dallas. They do the same thing, but they have like absolutely. The team that the Cowboys shit. <laughs> <laughs> they actually have. I'm like, getting ideas for man <laughs> They have a big screen. I don't know what that team that the Cowboys is cheer for. They have, they have like a big screen, right. up to where you kind of feel like you're at the game, even though if you're like way in the nosebleeds, you can still see. Yeah, well, they, they, they have to do that, and like a lot of them. Even at, at uh, MetLife, the, you know, with Giants and the Jets play, if you go to one of the boxes, they give you this sort of monitor that you can carry with you that gives you sort of up-to-date statistics. About, you know, and it only works in the stadium. And again, they're trying to improve that experience. They're also doing things like the Eagles are trying to get uh, former players to come. So again, there's stuff you can't get at home. But the viewing experience at home has become so good. You have a big TV, you've got really good announcers, You've got these cameras that you mean you know the camera work 
work is astounding. Same with baseball. I mean, the camera work is unbelievable. Like, you know, baseball follow it on TV is so superior because you can see, you know, how how he threw the ball. You know, if you're at a stadium, you're so far away. It's hard to even tell. I mean, it's more just like you're hanging out. Uh, and things are expensive. You know, it's very expensive. You know, like a Coke a stadium is nine dollars or something like that. And you're like, well, I could get a case of Coke and sit at home and you know invest in a giant TV. You know. But anyway, so the idea is you're starting to see, so Disney's doing this with the iPad, trying to get people to sort of experience theater in a new way. Is there something there? They're just testing it. Other than that, so <clears throat> what was the protocol for Disney to go to Apple? <coughs> I mean, I guess it was really just a phone call. Oh, I, I, know, yeah. I mean, I, I don't even think there, there probably wasn't even a phone call. I think the iPad is sort of the preeminent had so I mean you know if you were a droid user I'm sure they could probably try to accommodate but I think I think again it's more just for this is a test you know I don't think I don't think they like had to call and say you know, hey Tim Cook or think of the thing of this I think it's just more important. Yeah. How well do you really think that will go though? I have no idea. I mean they interviewed people that thought it was great and to your point other people were like it was totally distracting so but you can start to imagine this may not be the end but it might be the beginning of New ways of experiencing things. You know, maybe there'll be something in the seat. You know, whether it's you know they tried that with you know sensors on the seat, you know, sensor round or these things where the seats would rumble, like you talked about in football, or there'd be smells, or there'd be sort of sensations that would give you the sense that you're experiencing the movie, just like 3D. So they're looking for new ways to get people to be entertained. Wouldn't that be 4D then? Would that? Wouldn't that be like a 4D thing? Because I'm just talking about because it's like. I've heard about it, but I'm trying to figure out, like, how would that would work? Be if you have, like, the theater where it's not just 3D because it's coming out at you, but then you also have yeah, I guess, yeah, yeah, experience, like, rumbling of that nature. Yeah. I, I'm, Disney does that. Yeah, Disney yeah. does Disney that. Disney does it. Yeah. 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 I've read that um, this new the cinema will start to change. No longer will tickets only be $13 anymore. Going to the movies is going to cost more. It's just like how people pay for Broadway shows now. It's more and more expensive. It's like a bill. Right. Well, that was sort of, again, <laughs> earlier in the summer, Steven Spielberg and George Lucas were on a panel, and they said that. And it's like, if you have a couple of these big train wrecks, which kind of happened, I mean, there was, you know, if you have five or six of these very expensive films that falter, the model's going to have to change. And that, in fact, did happen this summer. Um, Lone Ranger, RIPD, White House Down. I think there were several others where there was, you know, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars lost, and the thought being, at some point, we talked about this last week. You went to see Insidious, which cost five million dollars to make. You paid thirteen dollars, irrespective of what it cost. You didn't care what it cost. You wanted a viewing experience. So the thought is, maybe down the road they'll start to say, this movie cost three hundred million dollars to make. If you want that that visual experience, just like you might pay eighteen to go to a three D movie you might pay more to go see a more expensive movie and less to see a cheaper movie. Just, you know, again, this is price sensitivity, but if you think of, uh, um, I don't know, there's that Lindsay Lohan movie, the, the Canyons, right? You can see that in the theater for 13 and you can watch it, you can stream it at home for 6.99. So that's, you know, what increasingly they're giving you these options of, there's different paying models. If you want to go to the theater, it's $13, you want to watch it at home. But they don't make it that clear that it's at home, so if you're savvy, I mean, I saw the movie, the Margin Call, whatever, a year or two ago or something, and that was one of the first ones that did this sort of day and date streaming, VOD, and it was $13 in the theater, but I could have watched it at home for seven, but I didn't know that. And I had I known it, I wouldn't have gone. You know? So again, a lot of this is sort of getting you to watch it in the way you're gonna watch it, pay what you're willing to pay. I feel like with paying like $7 to watch at home is, better in the sense that more than one person can watch it because we go to the movies we're going to pay $13 right. each. Just you, and then popcorn and check it, right. No, no, that's, that's the way a lot of people think, you know, it's like, well, and you don't have to select all the way to the theater, you know, and some people love the theater experience, some people love the sort of the big screen, you know, so but that's a very good point. And that's, and that, your behavior, this is what you should always think about is your behavior is probably somewhat representative of other people's behavior. So if you think that makes sense, other people probably do, and the other people will start to do that increasingly. And as your TV gets bigger and better and more interactive at home, that decision gets easier and easier. And as the couch and the man kid gets comfortable and comfortable, you're like, why would I go to the stadium? Or why would I leave? It's so cozy here, it's raining out, and the ticket for the basketball game is $120, and this is great. Yeah. 
So the seats with like the sensations actually exist. I yes. saw Avatar. Oh like, yeah. In one of those chair things, it was like twenty five dollars. How was it? It was fine. It was kind of like a ride. Yeah, yeah it was kind of like a ride. Like, that was a cool. Long. Well, that was kind of the cool thing I felt about Avatar. Again, it's you know. I went and saw it on the Upper East Side, you know, on like 86th Street, and it's just this small, nondescript theater. You know, they give you the 3D glasses, and it turns into a ride almost. Like you're going almost on this adventure, and you're paying $18. It's almost like you're you've gone to Disney World or one of those places and had this kind of wild interactive experience. And a lot of people in the film business thought this is going to change everything. Why? One, piracy. You can't really pirate that experience at this point. Two, it gets people back to the theater, so however comfortable your home is, you can't do this at home. Three, we can charge more money. The problem was, what happened? The consumers, people, said, you know what? I don't need to see every movie in 3D. Like, certain movies, yeah, but if you're just going to run it through sort of a 3D filter, and like every once in a while, you're like, yeah. <laughs> 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 right. So I, I don't need to do that. I don't need to. And, and, and what it gets to is, to, to her point, is that price sensitivity of like, I'm not going to, I can see it in 2D, I don't need to see it in 3D, you know? And you do, you know, I don't know if you got, there's some people like, for instance, Great Gatsby probably said, you should definitely see that in 3D. And there's other movies like, eh, it doesn't really matter, right? So, um, so it goes both ways. And again, what they're doing is experimenting, and they're experimenting to get your money, or to sort of find ways to entertain you, to get you to come and experience things, and to charge $25. So you, you, you did it, it worked, right? I haven't seen another movie like that. Yeah, I haven't never heard of it. No, I've never heard of it. It's like a thousand hours from red. Okay. <laughs> well, again, it was probably a test. So just like this you know, little murder thing. But again, what they're always doing is trying to test things differently. Um, just quickly, we'll go through these very quickly. On the reading, so we're starting this sort of, you know, again, the irrefutable laws of reading again. All these books, they come up with a number, and they say they're irrefutable or they're refutable. So it's 21. We'll go through them. They're not, you know, they are refutable, first of all. And second of all, you know, there are probably more than 21. Or so, But the first one is the law of the lid. What's the law of the lid? Anyone want to try that? It sort of means that you have a limit to your possibility of a leader. Right. So, Do you agree with that? No. No. I, yes and no. I think there's, I mean, I, I just thought that was an unnecessary way of maybe putting it, but I think there is something to the fact that some people are better, some people are more experienced, some people have learned more throughout their experience in life. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's sort of a, a scale thing. I think there might be other things you do that, and some things that are good for right. other things. Exactly. So who, some of you, did you disagree with um, So what is the law of the lid that he talks about? What does that mean? That's your, your success level. I guess you put it on one through 10. It's like whatever that number is, your leadership, whatever, without your, well, I think I discussed that completely backwards. Okay. But your leadership is based off of, your success is based off your leadership. Yeah, so your, your capacity for leadership is, is going to be the outer limit or the lid on what you can execute against for the most part, you know? And he gave the example of, what was the example he gave? McDonald's. 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 So what happened with McDonald's? Well, they were very successful at the beginning, and you know, they started to want to sell uh, franchises they basically couldn't make because they were good enough beer, so then uh, this guy, uh, uh, no, right, some credit card. Yeah. Um, then he went on to be CEO, and then did a McDonald's. So I mean, again, we we can sort of just basically. I mean, have you ever heard of the Peter Principle? You know, what the Peter Principle is. Peter, it's kind of a good one actually. But the Peter Principle is that everybody eventually gets promoted to their level of incompetency, yeah. meaning that. You know, you're doing a great job, you're doing great, we're going to promote you, we're going to promote you. And eventually you're like, oh, I'm a little above my, I don't deserve to be here. And then what happens is you do a bad job. So you know, sometimes it's good to know, and sometimes like in, in a work environment for yourselves too, or for a career, you don't want to get promoted too fast because you may get promoted to a level that you're above your capacity. You know, they gave the example of um, Abraham Lincoln, you know, where he was leading this group and he ended up, he started the captain and ended as a private because he was sort of out of his depth. So sometimes it's better to sort of, be like, I'll get there eventually, but I want to get promoted when I can do the job well, versus just sort of, you know, glorify myself in the title and then fail. You know, so the idea of the Peter Principle is 
people do keep getting promoted to the point where eventually they're no longer good at what they do. You know, and it sort of happens. You know, again, examples would be like Dan Quayle. You know, I'm not saying Dan Quayle deserves that, but Dan Quayle was a you know competent, successful senator, and he became vice president. And they sort of you know he probably was like I was happy being senator, and then he became vice president. You know, so sometimes you get promoted to your level when they say oh, it's competence. So that's the future. And the idea of this is, you know, the McDonald's brothers, who knows if they even wanted that or, you know, they may have tried. So sometimes it's just better saying, well, let's get someone, you know, the conditions may have been better, they may have fit Ray Kroc's skill level better. You know, so who knows what that is. Same thing you gave the example of, you know, uh, Wozniak and Jobs. is like, Wozniak, you know, I don't think he had any ambition, really. He just wanted to make code and make cool computers. And Steve Jobs is the one who saw the potential. Steve Jobs, that's sort of what people always said. Steve Jobs saw the potential in things that other people didn't. He, was, he wasn't necessarily the innovator of them, but he saw the application. The example is he went to a Xerox Park a long time ago. When he, Xerox wanted to be an investor in Apple. They said, well, here's the deal. You can invest a million dollars in Apple, but I get a tour of Xerox Park, which is sort of their innovation lab. And in there, they had a prototype, probably not the same, you know, much more clunky than this, but they had an ounce. And He'd never seen the one before. And apparently, when he left Xerox Park, he was like, say, on Wednesday. By Thursday, he had his designer, and he says, we got to make something that does this. I want it to be able to, you know, I want it to be like this big. I want it to be able to roll on my blue jeans, and I want to be able to make it for less than $15. And the guy apparently went to, like, the Walgreens. He got, like, those leg um, pantyhose containers, and that was the, sort of the early day of the mouse. Because Xerox had it. They didn't know what it was. They didn't. They didn't see the application that he did, and they, you know, it would have cost them three hundred thousand dollars, you know, per to make. So he saw the ability if you could sort of make this on a cheap level, it could be applicable to this sort of a larger audience, just like Henry Ford did. You know, Henry Ford didn't create the car; he mass produced the car for the car. And he got, you know, and as the as the as the Ford Model T uh, models came out, they didn't get more complicated; it got more simple. You know, so they started taking features off because then they could bring the price down and they could sort of democratize it and anyone could buy a car. And that's what Henry Ford did. He came up with the whole idea of the assembly line. So sometimes it's someone sees something that other people don't see. So the idea of the lid is maybe really grow into the position that you should be in. The next one that we talked about is the law of influence. What's the law of influence? Easy. Law of you almost live by. Come on. Anybody want to try law of influence? Uh, the law of influence is really based on somebody else. That's right. Okay. Okay. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Okay. Well, I mean, if you if you want to lead, you need people to follow you. Otherwise, you're just taking a walk. That, that's good. That was a good line, right? So if, 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 if no one's following you, you're just on a random walk by yourself. Really. You need to be able to be the person who's like, yes, that's a good idea. And everyone else is like, oh, yeah, that is a good idea. Right. If, otherwise, if you're just like, that's a good idea, and no one else responds, you're not really Right. What I took from that also is it's not really who you're following, it's what you're following. So, I mean, if somebody says I'm following that person, you're not really following the person, you're following what their vision is. Right. And, and it goes back to the vision and the mission. If you can get behind it, if you believe in it, but if you don't believe in it, you're not going to follow it, right? Um, so I feel like to influence people, you have to have like the key characteristics of being trustworthy or good character and all those things. And so, I guess that falls into it too. Well, is that true? To be a good leader? Or well, to be a, maybe a moral leader, but, but there's certainly a lot of leaders who are not necessarily good that were effective at getting people to follow, right? Mm -hmm. Or his, you know, his work. Right? Yeah. Yeah. You know. um, I like how he kind of explains the difference between leadership and management. Mm -hmm. you never really care about that. And then also the example of Saatchi, when you kick like, Saatchi out and everyone pretty much follows him. Right. That's like a really good example. No, it is a really good example. And, it, and you gave an example too of Mother Teresa too. Right. And, and uh, there's a good story of Mother Teresa. So Edward Bennett Williams was a big um, successful attorney. And he owned, the, uh, he owned the Redskins and he also owned the Baltimore Orioles. And Mother Teresa came to see him. He represented like a lot of mob bosses and stuff like that. So he was kind of, you know, he was, he was good. Uh, he was a good negotiator. And Mother Teresa came to see him, looking for some money. And uh, he's like, it's a pleasure to meet you. Thanks for coming. You know, tiny little Mother Teresa. And uh, what can I do? You know, I need some money for my charities. And uh, 
He said, well, unfortunately, our money's already been earmarked, but it's such an honor to meet you. I appreciate it. We'll keep you in mind in the future. And she said, give me your hand, Mr. Williams. Let's pray. And he like, got down on his knees, and they said, like a prayer. And he's like, hey, pleasure to meet you. Thanks for coming by. Let's pray. <laughs> he's like, anyway, thank you for coming by. Give me your hand. Let's pray. And eventually he's like, you got the money, get out of my office. And he's like, I've dealt with some of the hardest negotiators, and that woman, that little squeaky little woman, was the best negotiator I've ever met in my life. Because she played to him. And again, sometimes that is, and like you said, she was persuasive. She wasn't, it wasn't selfish. She was asking for, for other people. And she made it almost impossible for him to say no. And she just kept doing it and appealed to a sort of other area. So again, sometimes a leader isn't isn't the biggest person in the room, isn't the most impressive, isn't the loudest, if they're using other tools to, to lead, right? So that's, again, that's the idea of uh, influence. Um, in one of the, my other classes, we talked about like, mission statements and how like they can be really helpful in getting people to go to their company. Totally. And Facebook's mission statement is just like connecting people. And it's, just, it's just what? It, it's, I was trying to look it up exactly. It's in my notes, but I can't find it. But it. It's just essentially that they want to connect people. Be nice to people. Uh, connect. Connect. connect people. Connect people. Yeah. And it's like if you if your mission, oftentimes like companies with really mission statements that are really clear, that like that, right. um, like who can't get behind connecting people? No. And then face and look at what Facebook. So, so, so and, that, and that's part of the reason. Like, so even even something like Procter and Gamble, which you're like, well, who could get you know? This seems like a disparate group of consumer products. But truthfully, that was fairly well written, and you know, I kind of believed it. I kind of believe that they really believe that, and that they're trying to improve people's lives with their products. And when 4.8 billion people are using their products, you can kind of get behind that. Yeah. You know? um, okay, we'll just click through these last two. The law of process. They talked about the woman who was a um, who was sort of treated shabbily and had a very low pension and made a lot of money, right? And she ended up giving it all away. So what would be the law of process? Process is a really good thing to think about. Anything again, something like even this vision, mission statement, or the strategic planning process is it's just imposing a process. So you're not you're you're thinking about things kind of in a process way. You don't want to make process sort of replace creativity, but sometimes process can sort of engender creativity. And you can start to say, this is how we're going to make things work. Or you know, the example is Barishnikov. Barishnikov, um, you know, I think we've talked about this one before. He does the same routine dance, uh, prepare for his dance that he did when he was five years old. He's done it every day of his life. Um, so it's a process. It's not like I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna naturally be a great dancer. I need to do these things to support it. Or they gave us sort of the quote where it's like, you know, you don't, champions aren't made in the ring, they're recognized there. You know, all that time, the training, everything that went into it, that's the process to become great. Or the Emmys, you know. In theory, a lot of those people were going to dancing schools or, you know, acting classes all over this year, and they culminated, they got recognized last night, but that, that's not really where they succeeded. They succeeded probably quietly in some dark room a long time ago. Um, or, you know, ice skaters, you know, where their parents are driving them at five in the morning since they were a little kid. So at the Olympics, they may get a gold medal, but that gold medal is really the recognition of those years and years of that cold, lonely period of working towards that goal. So the process is imposing the process. Um, and again, they talk about you know, an example too is Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan, great basketball player, um, and he's right handed. And so, where does he practice? Where did he use to practice? Going left, right? He knows how to do that. Where is his weakness? Focus on his weakness, improves the weakness, he'll just get better. So think about where you're strong and then where your weakness may be. Okay, we'll do one last one here. The law of navigation. We'll talk again about Amundsen and Scott because it's a pretty good story. But what is the idea just behind navigation? Again, you can, you can sort of same thing as sort of the mid vision mission sort of do this too. You have to plan for the long haul. Plan for the long haul. Like where, where are you trying to get? How are you going to get there? What are you going to do along the way? You can't just sort of, you know, sometimes it is good to just start the journey, but you also have to have to plan the long term, which will invariably change. Okay? And that's kind of what we're going to talk a little more about today. It's a sort of processing, planning process. Um, the two other readings that I just talked about, so there's one about um, 
How do you work with someone you don't like? What was the sort of takeaway from that? How, who here works with someone they don't like? <laughs> wow, nice. And how do you, how do you, and, and what is the hard part about it? Yes? Um, well, in the reading, what he basically was saying, I didn't like Jeff. And how, um, basically giving all these characteristics of Jeff that he didn't like, but later realizing that Bill, he's the same person, and that's why he didn't like him, really. I, a little bit. I think part of it is, is maybe sometimes that the elements of a person that you work with you don't like, sometimes it might be that there's something about yourself you don't like, or it's a, it's a trait of your own that you don't like. And therefore, you might better understand Jeff <laughs> or other people if you start to look at it that way. Because, you know, everybody, you know, in theory, we're all trying to do our best and we're out there struggling. And, and sometimes people interpret um, certain behaviors in a different way. Um, so th when you think about the person that you work with, because sometimes, look, without a doubt, there are people that are just difficult people. They're, or they're ineffective at their job, which makes them difficult to work with. Or they, and sometimes that goes back to the Peter principle, they're not good at their job, and that, and that insecurity about that comes down on you because they don't, they, you know, you're trying to help them or something. So again, it can be challenging. But there is a case that in some instances is, you know, whether it's someone you work with or someone you know, Sometimes there is that kind of mirror on yourself and maybe there is an element of them that you don't like about yourself and maybe there's a way. So I would encourage you, whoever you, if you are in an instance where you're working with something you don't like, because you, if you aren't, you will eventually. I can guarantee you that. You will eventually work with someone you don't like uh, or you don't get along with or you have trouble with. So use the person you're working with now as your like test. To be like, I understand I'm going to meet Jeff Again, maybe Jeff will be with me forever. I'll meet sort of, you're going to meet lots of Jeffs in your life. So what are you going to do? Are you just going to go home and complain about it? Or are you going to be like, maybe I'll use this example of Jeff to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to get, I'm going to figure out a way to work with Jeff. Whether, you don't become friends with Jeff, but maybe there's a way, maybe you could, who knows? You might be able to find that entry point. And this is where management and leadership start to have an effect of like, you're going to deal with people you don't like. So, and just like Mother Teresa, Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela have dealt with people they don't like. So, how are you going to work around it? You're not going to just get defeated. Well, I thought that uh, the example from the reading that was really helpful and straight up for me was the difference between being defeated and being defeated. And, and the truth is, if you can do that, how much better are you going to do when you are in an instance where someone, so consider Jeff or whoever it is as a challenge and be like, if I can make Jeff work in the way I want him or her to, then I can do anything. Imagine how easy it's going to be when there's someone who isn't Jeff. There's someone I, who's Jane, and I like Jane. So, so again, it's a good example of that. Of Don't get like dismayed. You're like, oh, you're driving me crazy. It's like, think of it as like, right, this is a perfect little test. This is a lab. Let me see how I do. And easier to do it now than later when it's going to be much, you know, maybe the stakes will be even higher. So just try to experiment and like, whatever, see what happens to them. You may annoy them more, but it doesn't sound like you're down by that huge. So if you don't like them, just take a week and be like, I'm going to see if I can get my version of Jeff to either easier to work with or more pleasant or more tolerable or a way to work around. Like, I'm going to hack it. Like, I'm going to hack the Jeff phone. And I'm going to figure out a workaround, right? So sometimes it's just like, you know, Jeff always tells me at the last minute. And maybe it's just a way of managing up a little bit, right? And if you do that effectively, um, Jeff might start looking out for you. Or in that instance where if you reached out to someone, they're like, thank you so much. And then they're going to back for you, you know? So it can really have these interesting benefits. So just, again, use it as an experiment. Um, and, uh, so this is the main one. Do you try to do the readings because I think it just helps sort of the discussion here a little bit. And the um, uh, yeah, there are you know leadership is is all sorts of things. So, you know you have this book as sort of a guidepost, but you know there are a lot of different ways to approach these things. Uh, 
Um, and uh, let's see, turn this one here. So we talked about the, the vision and the mission. You brought up the vision for Facebook, and we read the uh, sort of the, the rules, sort of the guiding rules of, of Google, and then that the statement from Procter and Gamble. So you realize a lot of these places. Are you familiar? Has anyone looked into what their vision or mission is for their own organization? No. It's worth doing because it is worth doing. Because you might be like, huh. Oh, we are so afield from what our vision and mission is, or our vision and mission is, is kind of akin to Acme's, or you know, this is really helpful and it helps me, you know, understand. And maybe we're, and maybe there's a way I can actually get Jeff because he's not even paying attention to that. This is what we represent. Um, so it's worth looking at. It's if you can find it, and you may not even have one. All right. So we talked about this last time, all right? So the idea of leading is to sort of inspire the effort, want to motivate people. Communicate the vision, but build enthusiasm. Like you said, if you can get behind, if, if the mission is to connect, you're like, who can't get behind that? You know, it's like an enforcer, right? And it's only connect. Like you just want to connect. Um, then you want to put in some kind of process. We need a planning. So we'll talk a little bit about planning today. We'll talk about organizing next week, and then control. So you're doing your vision and your mission. Um, we talked about this last week. You're doing your vision and your mission, and that's where you want to get to. So if you were to lay out a plan to get towards your mission and your vision, what would you do for what would you do next? You want to try what would you do next? Uh, what would I do next? Let's say I have a vision. Yeah, you've got a vision and mission, you want to lay out a plan, a strategic plan take you or your organization right. for it, what would you do? What would be the next kind of obvious thing to do? I would uh, talk to people I think to get me connected with. I mean, I, I well, you're just laying out the plan right now. Oh, I'm just laying out the plan. Yeah. Um, yeah I'd write it down. <laughs> I think I'm like missing the obvious. Yeah. Oh, what, what would you do? Sub-goals. Sub-goals, all right, that's good. All right, um, anyone else? I'd work backwards. You'd work backwards? Okay, that's good. So what does working backwards mean? So if I want to be CEO, what do I need to be before I am CEO? I need to be sort of right, there. Okay. What would right. I need to get there? What are the steps you need to take, right? And then, so take that all the way back, what happens? So that would mean finishing my master's degree grade. Okay, right. And, and that would mean saying, well, where am I now, right? So if you're going to go on a journey, probably, you know, if you do whatever, Google Maps, it's like, well, I want to get to, I don't know, Bushwick. Well, what would you do? You, what would you put in first? Where are you now, right? Any trip you're going to take, the first thing you do is like, where am I? So, so maybe you do is an inventory of where are you now? Like, what's going on right now? What is the current situation with me, with the organization? How can I evaluate the current situation? Because once I understand that, it'll be a lot easier to go forward, right? Because if we're taking that trip we talk about to California, well, where we are now has a lot to do with that. I'm not going to buy a ticket from Knoxville, right? We're going to have to go to Knoxville. So why don't I make a plan based on someone being in New York? All right, so we talked about this again last week. So you're defining your business, you're developing a vision. We're going to talk about these today. But you're going to sort of lay out where you are then, where you are now, when I say gap, it's a gap between where you want to get to. The, the gap is your vision and where you are now. What's the, what's the gap? What's the split? Right now, your gap between the CEO, in your mind at least, is I'm a student. I have to finish my degree. I have to do 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 do. So the gap is these 10 steps between <coughs> CEO and that. So where, what do I have to do? Then we'll lay out a plan. We'll implement the plan. We'll refine it. We'll just go. We'll start the process. All right. So where are we now on this journey we're going to do? So the simplest one again. It's pretty. Um, it's almost trite. But a SWOT. And what's this? Anyone do a SWOT analysis? Yes. Uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Right. And why do you do that? To kind of evaluate the like, arena that you're working in. Right. So you can see where you're. And it's so simple. Again, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's a real, like, if you ever need a very, very, again, almost trite, simple way to evaluate the current situation, 
it's this. It's so easy. It's a little like, even if you know your boss says, like, well, just give us a sense of how we're doing. I mean, and, and even putting the word analysis after it is almost like giving it too much like, attention because it's not really analysis. You just say it's really like a list of pros and cons to some degree. But it's a very helpful way to start thinking about things. All right. So, what are your strengths? Again, what are your strengths as an individual? What are your strengths as an organization? That's something internal, right? I'm fast. I'm strong. I'm tall. I'm whatever. Um, weaknesses also internal. Opportunities. That's external. That's outside of us. What are the opportunities, right? And what are the threats? What would the threat be? Competitors. Competitors, right? Competitors or changes in the marketplace or changes in the availability of certain resources, uh, changes in laws. <coughs> so there's certain threats. Like a threat to Blockbuster was Netflix. A threat to HBO now is Netflix. Right? And sort of coming out of nowhere. So the purpose of SWOT analysis, again, I, I hesitate to saying analysis, but like I said before, these are all just tools you can use. You can discount them, but if you know them, you can at least be like, well, here's something I can do. It's just a tool that I can use. I'll put it in my tool belt. I may never use it, but this is a very simple one to use for a lot of things. It's just a like a checklist almost. So it's an easy to use tool for developing an overview of a company's strategic situation. It forms a basis for matching your company's strategy to a situation, right? I want to get here, like, right, where am I today? What are my strengths? Um, it's a starting point, too. So. You, you can understand what strengths are. I don't know what strengths are. So opportunities uh, is a chance for a firm to grow or progress due to a favorable juncture of the circumstances in the business environment. So emerging customer needs, quality improvements, expanding global markets, vertical integration. So the two things you read, well, we talked about Apple, we talked about the Apple, and what's an opportunity? China, right? So if they want to keep growing, China and Yang are a good opportunity, right? Same thing when we looked at um, Procter & Gamble. They're saying we already serve 4.8 billion people, and if we want to get everybody, well, what's an opportunity to get that other 2.2? If we want to get everybody, well, right now they're not even developed, so we can reach out to them in a more charitable way, maybe sort of burnish our, our you know, fulfill our mission, but also then start to see future customers and maybe what their needs are, and maybe new products, right? A threat is a factor in the company's external environment that poses a danger to its well-being. And they often talk about this even in the startup world. You're like, well, we have no competitors. Well, if you have no competitors, then you probably don't have a good product because there's, or there, you will have one very soon. Um, and that's why you know a lot of these companies we talked about Instagram. I think you were against Instagram, right? And uh, but Instagram just popped up, and Facebook bought it. And again, Facebook could have made it itself, but they, you know, it's those threats in the garage, the people in the garage that are making these things that are really hard to compete against, right? Because they can look at Google, they can look at Microsoft and see what they're doing, but it's that thing that comes out of nowhere that catches on and is cool, is harder to sort of compete against. So new entry by competitors, changing their demographics or shifting demand, emergence of cheaper technologies, all right? So again, if you start looking at it, well, what are our real risks in the future? Or you can do it from a country. What are the real risks to America? All right, you start thinking, well, there's the Middle East, there's Syria, but then they start thinking about there's a technology war, you know? People just get you know, clothing off our grid. So again, this is what they're doing in the Pentagon and, and the State Department is what are the risks? What are the threats, right? Let's make a list of what are our opportunities? Where can we grow? So again, think of it, it applies and apply to you too. What is, if you're planning your financial situation, you know, is you lose your job. So what? how are you going to counter the, the, the threat of losing your, that income? Well, some people will then get you know, insurance or if I had a bad accident. Sure. So these are ways to combating those risks. But if you're not thinking about it, you're like, ah, oh, things are going to be great. But if you have a plan, you're like, I'm counting on X amount of money, but that may change, right? It may go up, it may go down. But if I'm encountering that threat, then I'm planning a little bit. You obviously can't counter everything, but you can think about it. Regulatory requirements, higher risk. Like 
like I said earlier. So opportunities and threats form a basis for external analysis. So ex by examining the opportunities, you can discover untapped markets and new products or technology or identify potential avenues for diver diversification. So Disney and their little iPad, Little Mermaid experiment, you know, try it out. It might be an opportunity, it might not be, but you're trying it out. You're seeing, is there an opportunity? What did the people think? Did they like it? What did you think of the Rumble Team? We didn't really like it, and we haven't heard much about it again since. So it, it was an opportunity that really wasn't an opportunity, but they tried it, you know? By examining the threats, you can identify unfavorable marketable shifts or changes in technology and create defensive posture aimed at preserving your competitive position. We'll talk a little bit more about this um, in a couple weeks. But what can you? What is something you can do against a threat? What's that? Get as much information. Get as much information. Just buy it. Just buy it. threat. I'm gonna buy it. Or a person too. There's a lot you need some money, obviously, to do that. What's that? Develop a competitive advantage. Exactly. Um, anyone else? Sometimes too, what they'll say, we'll talk about this again, but one other thing you can do is what, what they'll call is a, a barrier to entry. What's a barrier to entry? It's like, it keeps your competitive from, um, uh, for example, I guess, uh, Commonwealth, the book industry at one point had a barrier to entry because it was so much to produce a book, right? But now, you can produce a book really cheaply, so that, that, that barrier kind of like, Exactly. So what would be a business with a high barrier to entry? Uh, like airplanes. Airplanes. Why? Because it takes a lot of technology to like build an airplane or your purchase an airplane that's already been built. Right. And there are a few suppliers. Right. So it's hard to just jump into that market. Right. And it's incredibly expensive, right? I mean, to buy like, you know, your, your own little Boeing would be really expensive. <laughs> so we decided, you know, I want to start an airplane company. Well, one barrier to entry is I need a lot of money. Right? So that's the first barrier for me to even get in there. Then there's the brand marketing and everything like that. Or how about the cable business? Great business. What do I got to do? I got to wire the country. So that's not fair. You know, but cool. I want to be in the big cable. I'm, gonna, I'm going after Comcast and Time Warner Cable. So I'm just going to go door to door and see if you if you let me shove a wire into your house. The first I have to lay the wire out. So that's a pretty big barrier to entry, isn't it? What's a low barrier to entry? What's that for? International technology company. International technology company? Yeah. Mm How -hmm. so? Well, you know, the software we can program and then deprogram the advantage that Okay. So, someone want to give you another example? Developing an app? No. Developing an app, relatively low, right? You can just do it, you know, and in fact, there's now apps that help you build apps. <laughs> and you, think you can do it for like $2,000, and it's you know, clever. You know, Angry Birds is not very sophisticated, but so, and to get into that business is not, it's pretty low. Or like Hubert's point was writing a book. It used to be you needed a publisher, but now you can self-publish. Now the barrier there is getting the attention of the market. Like doing a craft on Etsy. Right, a craft on Etsy. So the barrier, you know, you can actually get distribution. You didn't mean, you don't need to go to like you, know, you don't need to drive to the farmers market and sell your you know, macrame there. You can sell it on Etsy. Um, I'll be selling macrame at the end of the class. <laughs> <laughs> I was say entering the music business or entering like the music industry before you have to talk to a uh, A and R to try to get your name into the right. door. Now they have so many music showcases and even on YouTube right. you self discovery. Still really hard though. You still need, you know, it's still you still need someone to sort of pick you up, spend the money in the market. You're gonna say. Well, I was gonna say, I want people who make their living off of making YouTube videos. It costs you nothing, but you still have a ton of creative attitude. Yeah. So, so you can, but again, the challenge is, but yes, you can, you can make a YouTube video, and you can, but it's very, the, 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 the challenge there is, it's just, you know, it's incredibly competitive. It just needs to cut through. Is it more? Um, being a food vendor. Food vendor, yeah. Like selling inexpensive food. Right. Yeah. I mean that that's there's not a very high barrier to that, right? Like you can 
you can, we can all go down to the wholesale market. You probably have to get some kind of license, or right? it's not that expensive. And then your point of difference, you gave us your competitive advantage. And you could be, I get the best fruit, or I'm really nice, or I've got the best corner. Like you start then, and then you start getting a little bit of business, you can expand your business, and then you can start putting barriers to entry up for yourself and being like, you know what, I have the best corner, so I'm gonna get like two things so no one else will come, or I'm the night I know everybody, so no one's gonna come to this. So the barrier to entry then is and the barrier to entry now for Blackberry to get back into the smartphone business is is the brand loyalty that Apple has. So undoing that's gonna be helpful. And I mean Google. What they have is they've set such a high barrier of entry right now. They yeah. like for so anyone to ever compete with Google is going to be very difficult. In what? Not in anything like in emails and search, search and the maps and the, I mean there's maybe not Android is the best, but like just the expand they have on the web, it's it's impossible. I was actually going to say earlier, like to Google's point, like they own like 95 percent of search right now, yeah. and then. Um, an article came out and it was comparing Google with Yahoo about 10 years ago and how Google and Yahoo 10 years ago owned like 1.3 billion in um, sales revenue and now Google's at like 47 billion and Yahoo is still at like, it's, it's grown because of the new um, head, but it's only at like 4.7. And Microsoft could have bought Google for a million dollars. <coughs> um, but you know, they didn't see them as a threat. They just didn't think it was worth it, you know what I mean? So, this is the challenge, is to sort of see where these threats are and to see where the future is and to see where these opportunities are. So, again, it's very easy. Now, this is a little less useful, but we'll go through it quickly anyway. Past, anyone give me a sense of that? Past analysis? Yeah, analysis. <laughs> so it's Political factors, economic factors, social culture factors, and technological factors, right? So again, the easier one to do is just a SWOT analysis. You can just quickly say, what do we do well? Where's our growth area? You know, um, where are our weaknesses? What's our opportunity? What's our threat? Again, so very, you can click to just do bullet points. It's a really, you, it might even be worth you to do it just with your own organization that you work and just do a quick, like, what are we good at? What are we good at? Where's our opportunity? And just see, you know, are you doing things to combat these various um, opportunities and threats? Political would just be, you know, legislation against monopolies. There's a case against Google now. Uh, there's also a case against LinkedIn for potentially stealing people's emails, or breaking in and taking people's private information. So that is a threat to LinkedIn, a threat to Google. And it, it, may, it may not be a long-term threat, but it's certainly a short-term threat, and it also affects its perception, therefore its ability to raise money and all other things. Environmental protection laws, taxation policy, employment laws. There's a new law that's coming out where you can now, um, which is good, but for like startups, you can you can crowdsource, you know, and it's because right now if you crowdsource from Kickstarter, it's just it's really just a donation. Whereas the new law will allow you to crowdsource from people. So if you, like if someone here wanted to start a company and people gave you $10, $1, $100, they would become investors. Whereas in Kickstarter, you're just sort of supporting them and they'll give you a t-shirt. You know, but you have no investment. You'll be able to uh, raise about a million dollars per year. It's pretty great. You know? So if, you're, if you have an idea for a startup and you can crowdsource that money, you can really be on your way to making it your business idea. Economic factors, you know, inflation, employment, disposable income, being, you know, how much money do people have really to do with just general business cycles, energy availability and costs. Again, so these are things you may want to think about, you know, obviously maybe less a concern in the United States, but still a concern, but if you're trying to enter a smaller market, you know, uh, there may be sort of political issues you need to address. There may be economic issues. Like, let's say you're trying to shoot a movie, um, you know, in, whatever, the mountains of the Amazon, well, some of the challenges you like, well, where are we getting electricity, you know, where are we staying? There's real issues that you have to address to make that work, and you have to take those into Social culture, demographics, distribution of income, social mobility, lifestyle changes, consumers, and levels of education. And again, as 
China sort of, you know, as the economy continues to grow and the middle class gets bigger, that's why China is becoming a more and more appealing market because one, from a political standpoint, it's opening up. Two, its middle class is getting larger, just like India's middle class has gotten considerably larger, and therefore that becomes an opportunity for consumerism and sharing, sharing of products, and that's why people sort of looking at these different trends. And then obviously technology, which can change things so quickly. You discover the innovation, sort of to your point, yeah, speed of technology transfer, rates of obsolescence. There's a thing today in the paper just about, you know, sort of these, um, just the cloud, the availability of the cloud. You know, there's, there's, there's so much competition just for this, you know, it's so cheap now to put stuff up in the cloud, you know, and it used to be you had these huge hard drives, and now, and now it's, you, know, you can get things for very little money up in the cloud. I mean, it's an amazing place where all this data is going to be found. Going to be talked again, so we're sort of bringing it back. And we have your vision, your mission, and you have some goals, objectives, initiatives, measures, targets. So you're working on these, but you're also working on your measures, which are your metrics. Okay. Come back again to here. So your vision. What's the difference between you do your SWOT analysis? Where are we today? What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What are the opportunities? What are the threats? All right. That's where we are today. What is the disconnect between where we are today and where we want to get to? How we go down, we lay out a plan. We're in New York, we want to get to California. How are we going to do it, implement it, and on the way, we continue to reevaluate and change. And halfway there, we may say, Chicago looks good to me, let's stay here. Or let's keep going to Hawaii, or let's go to Alaska, wherever you may. But your plans may change, but at least you have a plan to move forward. Does that make sense? Okay, we're going to do, well, we'll talk about this one. So, remember we talked about your, your big, hairy, audacious goal. All right, so when you're doing your vision, just think of your core, your core values, your core purpose. That's an easy way to start. Uh, and then start to think about any vision in the future. I mean, this may just help you sort of inform how you do it. A little bit about the difference between the vision and the mission. You can't think of the vision as the horizon, and the mission is sort of the way you plan to get there. All right. So now we're going to talk about this thing, the Boston Matrix. And again, it's another tool. It's a little silly, but it's sort of it was used by um, as a way to evaluate an organization. All right. So it was designed, devised by BCG. In the 1970s, it uses a tool to help determine where to allocate available cash in an organization, right? So it's a way to start thinking, what have I got? Again, it's another way to sort of take a snapshot of where are we and where should we be looking for the future. Again, it's sort of a strategic approach. So um, if you think over here, this is market growth, and this is market share. And Things go through this cycle. We have kind of cute little names, right? So, anyone want to take a crack at what these might mean? What would a, what would be? So, if you think here, this is high market share, low growth. What would be an example of something that is high market share for a company but low growth? Well, we, let's make it easier. Let's take Apple. Apple is the company, all right? So, if we look at Apple, where's something there where they have high market share but probably low growth going forward? Maybe like iPods. Maybe iPods, exactly. Right. Where is their star for Apple? Where is high market share, high growth? Like the iPhone, tablets, all right? So those are stars, all right? So if you're Apple and you sort of lay out your little playroom cards of stars and cash cows, where do you want to put your resources? iPhones and tablets, right? Growth. High growth, high market share. That's a good place. What about down here? What's a dollar for Apple now? So it's low market share, low growth. Laptops, desktop computers. Laptops, laptop, no, desktops probably even more so. Yeah. So laptops. Yeah. So um, still probably that might be closer to here, frankly. But what's something that they just don't didn't really not in TVs? Apple TV maybe. You know, there's still there's still probably opportunity there. Um, <coughs> anything else there that might work? Yeah. I'll put iPod over in, over in that area. You put iPhone over here? No, iPod. Oh, yeah, the iPod. Like, remember when you used to do this? iPhone. Yeah. Oh, iPhone. iPhone. 
That's, we're not even going to invest in that market. We're going to put that over. The DVD drive is now here. We're going to let. We're going to harvest that business. Uh, also, um, uh, Ethernet connections. They don't. They don't fit uh, the new I, um, Mac Airs. You have to get an adapter to connect it to the um, you know, to like a wall uh, Ethernet. Again, kind of amazing. Again, they're saying the future is wireless. So we're going to focus on that. We're not going to. We're not even going to. You know, it'll make it easier to make the computer smaller. We don't have to have the Ethernet connection. So. We'll focus our energy there. Um, again, so you start to see their decisions of where should we invest, where should we harvest, and then this, the problem title is like, what do we do with this kid? He's crying all the time, bang. Do we keep spending money on search or Apple? Do we keep spending money on apps or where <coughs> HP? Do we keep spending money making tablets? Um, or where Barnes & Noble? Do we keep spending money making nooks, right? Pretty big problem to Barnes and Noble, right? If they don't have the market leadership position, they don't really know where to go. There's a problem. So, we'll summarize this. We can, but so, dogs have low market share, low market growth. In these areas, market share is weak, so it's going to take a long time to get done. We won't be able to enjoy the economy to scale it better. Is it even worth preserving the dog? You know, um, preserving it. How much more are they costing? Could they be revived in some way? How much would it cost to continue to support such price? How much would it cost to remove from the market? Time Warner, you know, last year, I think so. Should we just sell magazines? Should we just get out of? Should we just get out of this business? We are making movies. We have the cable networks. Should we just get out of the movie? I mean, the magazine business. So they're trying to sell them. Uh, the Washington Post Company, the newspaper business. The newspaper was gone. Even though it's the name of the business, it was a dog. And they, so they sold it to Jeff Bezos you know, for $250 million. The New York Times sold it for a box and load. Um, uh, Rupert Murdoch's company just had to take a big write down because of the newspaper business. Because the newspaper business, in any way looking at this, would not be like, oh yeah, high growth. That's where we should put all our money in the newspaper business. It is, it's a dog. It's not a cash cow, it's a dog. And therefore, what do we do with it? Uh, business Week, uh, Newsweek. You know, Barry Diller tried to revive Newsweek. Yep. My question is, I think with the newspaper businesses like the Boston Globe and the Washington Post, like for those people that bought it, why? I mean, the Red Sox bought the Boston Globe. The yeah. Red Sox, <laughs> but the owners. <laughs> it was a big poppy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, you try. You answer that question for me. The only thing I can think of is reputation. Reputation. Like the Boston Globe and the Washington Post are, and Newsweek are reputable I mean, media companies that have contributed years and years and years of journalism. And there's a certain amount of like respect that that name holds within the industry for films, getting a different view from the Globe, or theater, and certainly the Washington Post political like coverage is key, and they broke the Nixon, you know what I mean, they're historical. A lot of time ago. Right, right, true. But so why? Yeah, yes, who does that better now? Politico. Who does it better? Politico. Oh, right, I'm already Who does? I'm using Post. They do it better. Um, there's a number of organizations that probably do it better than the Washington Post. What's that, I'm sorry. There's a number of organizations that probably do it better than the Washington Post, but the Huffington Post is one of them. Right. So the Huffington Post, just by contrast, the Huffington Post sold itself to AOL for three hundred million dollars, you know, four years ago. So, okay, start to think about that. Three hundred versus two fifty, you know, you know, for Ariana Huffington and a bunch of bloggers, you know, they got more money. They got twenty five percent more money than the Post. So, but why do you think they would buy? Because it is. I think. I think. I think Jeff Bezos would say it's certainly within the the kind of whatever. Orbit or, or landscape of the Washington Post company, it's dumb. And, it's bur and they're burning money. They're, they're running in a deficit every year. And at some point, you want to stop the leaving and say, and once we do that, then we can focus on our other businesses and be successful. The Washington Post also on Newsweek because they sold it. So you can just start seeing from a strategic standpoint, they're like, okay, we're going to stick Newsweek, Washington Post here. I don't know where they put it now, but Daily Kaplan's here. Our television network's probably here. And they probably have some, you know, uh, I think they've kept a couple of Washington Times, or like a couple other things, but maybe even a problem. 
but most likely the reason, you know, Jeff Bezos is not a stupid guy, but there's ego, there's, there's a, maybe a way that he sees that he can do something with it that other people won't be able to do. Um, you know, who knows what the real reason is, but a lot of times it is, like reputation, ego, um, the ability to get your message out, you know, so again, you know, rather than, it's a way to peddle influence, uh, also, so, you know, Rupert Murdoch, you know, is also a smart guy, so why is he holding on to the New York Post even though it's burning money in his pocket? Or because um, it's a way to peddle inputs. Um, anyway, we'll talk about this more next week. So for next week, bring your vision, your mission, your metrics, your resumes on paper at the beginning of class. And uh, there's some readings. We're going to try to address the linking, but if not, just copy the link and put it in your URL bar there. And uh, any other questions? Good. Have a good week.